Change the Equation is very pleased to host the After School Alliance as they release their newest report entitled Defining Youth Outcomes for STEM Learning in After School. And we're very pleased to host this most expert panel to discuss the report's findings. For those of you who have joined us before at a STEM salon, we like to hear from the experts, but we also especially want to have a lively conversation. So we limit our remarks. We pull the plug on folks if need be, though I've never actually done that. I'm, one day maybe, but so far I haven't actually done that. And we really try to have uh, a conversation with you and we're looking for hard and probing questions. So these are important issues uh, to ensure that we are successful in helping all kids master STEM and after school is clearly an important component. It is a very important venue for STEM because it complements in-school math and science learning. And it's also, from the point of view of Change the Equation, a very strong area of interest. Our member companies, some of which are represented in the room today, uh, invest fairly heavily in out-of-school programs, partly because they can see the impact of those investments more quickly. They can develop better relationships and they don't get caught in the red tape of in-school bureaucracy. But as after-school providers and funders have multiplied, those in the field have begun to grapple with the question of how do you know what's worth supporting and what is really a good program? There is such a proliferation, it's not so easy to tell the good from the, <clears throat> I'll just let my voice trail off here. So what in that less structured environment will really lead to quality. What can we do to ensure that the youngsters who are involved in after school end that involvement light years forward in terms of their enthusiasm and their knowledge? So the report takes a look at what providers, and providers are defined as those developing and leading after school programs, and funders, those giving the money away through grants, see as the best potential outcomes. The results may surprise you. Let me quickly introduce the panel. There's more information on these esteemed folks on your seats. Anita Krishnamurtha was the project lead in this report, and she heads up the Alliance's effort to advance policies, research, and partnerships in rich, authentic STEM after-school experiences. Ron Ottinger, executive director of the Noyce Foundation, which co-funded the report, uh, serves as executive director of that Noyce Foundation, and he oversees all program areas and operations, which aims to help young people become thoughtful, engaged, and curious learners. Noyce focuses both on improving the teaching of math and science, as well as expanding out of schools opportunities. Mark Greenlaw, seated to the far left, is the Vice President of Education Affairs and Sustainability of Cognizant, a Change the Equation member company. Mark is responsible for a broad range of programming focused on ensuring that Cognizant is operating in a sustainable, socially, and environmentally responsible manner. He oversees the Cognizant's Making the Future After School program which seeks to inspire students in STEM through hands-on experiences and help launch the Maker Education Initiative, which we may yet hear about. Now let us start with Anita to introduce defining youth outcomes for STEM learning in after school. Thanks. Thanks, Linda, and hopefully this won't be the first time you have to kick someone off, because. This has been a project that I've been working on for the past almost year, and I'm very excited about it, and I might go on, but I'll try to contain myself. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today. We really appreciate your interest and your hardiness in braving the cold to come out here this morning. Um, this, as, as, and, and I'm especially delighted that Linda and Change the Equation are hosting this event because Linda was one of the key people who really challenged me quite early on to start thinking about getting very specific 
about what kinds of outcomes after school programs could support for STEM learning. She said, Anita, you don't have to keep justifying the value of after school programs for STEM. We know they're valuable, we know they're key and essential, but you do have to start talking about exactly what it is they can do. So here we are getting specific. So this was our study team. Um, as Linda mentioned, I led this study and my um, comrade in arms was Bronwyn Bevan from the Exploratorium. Vicky Reagan Kuan um, sort of designed a lot of our data collection methodology and analyzed the data. And Jen Reinhardt from the After School Alliance. Um, we're very grateful to our funders, the SD Bechtel Jr. Foundation and the Noyce Foundation, which co-funded this study and are also just so incredibly supportive of after school STEM. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't thank the team at the After School Alliance, including Jody Grant, our executive director, who's here, um, because this truly was a team effort from going out to getting the funding, to doing the work, to the final stages of actually proofing the report and laying it out so you have that beautiful document that you can see in your folders. So what I'm gonna do today is because as you see the full, the, the report is in your folders and it's fairly long, so I'm not gonna go through all of it. I'm just gonna touch on a few key highlights. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time to talk about some of the nuances and details in the Q&A portion. Um, and so, and, and before I dive into the report, for those of you who may not know very much about the After School Alliance, I just wanted to flash this slide up to say that we're a nonprofit based here in DC. We work on national issues um, are, are relating to after school. We're primarily a policy and advocacy group. We do a lot of work in, around communications and making the case for after school um, funding. And um, we have a very deep and wide reach at the grassroots and grass tops, as you can see there. We work with a lot of providers across the country as well as a lot of systems builders across the country who are working on after school in general. And in STEM specifically, and so sort of this slide describes what we do generally as well as what we do in STEM. There are, again, sheets in your folder that talk a little bit about what we do generally as well as what we do in STEM. Um, and as you see here, as you might see from our previous slide when we talked about our reach, it really is very powerful and essential for us to do the kinds of work we do because it means that we have a very clear understanding of what the field needs and challenges and opportunities are because we have that deep reach into the grassroots and by working with the grass tops, we're actually able to do some of this kinds of system building work. And in STEM specifically, we do a lot of work around partnership building, disseminating information about best practices and model programs, opportunities um, that are available for after school folks. We create toolkits and other resources based on the needs that the field um, describes to us. We offer technical assistance and of course do a lot of policy advocacy and communications work. So as Linda, as I said at the beginning and as Linda described earlier, this study really came about because um, we know there's a lot of support for after school programs in general and for after school and, and for the role of after school in STEM education specifically. But I kept getting asked exactly what is it that after school can do for STEM? You know, we, we want to have it be clarified. We know you get kids excited and engaged, but what more can you do? At the same time, after after school providers all across the country were really enthusiastically embracing STEM programming. They were offering more and more, and these were beyond the 4-H and the Girl Scouts that had uh, sort of embraced STEM a long time ago. These were your rank and file providers across the country who were seeing that this was a great thing to get kids interested and were starting to offer more and more programming. And at the same time, the infrastructure and the support for after school STEM programming was growing at a very rapid pace. In the meantime, we also started having a lot of conversations about how you assess the impact of informal science education, including after school. And the National Research Council, in fact, had a meeting in, in, in June of 2012 about assessment of informal science education, including after school. We played a role in that meeting. 
and we were trying to figure out exactly how about you, how you go about doing that. And in this general education reform environment that we find ourselves in, where impacts and assessments are continually um, sort of debated and dis and discussed, we really wanted to make sure that the after school field had a voice in sort of trying to describe. Um, what it is that they felt were appropriate and feasible outcomes for after-school programs because we didn't want something being imposed on the field without taking into account exactly what its strengths were and what it might not be able to deliver. And so what we did was something called a Delphi study. And what this is, is it served, it, it, we do iterative surveys of an expert panel that sort of represents the field. And in this case, the experts were composed of two cohorts. There were expert after-school practitioners from all over the country, as well as what we sort of loosely termed supporters. So these included the funders, as well as some national education policy folks and state education department representatives. So these would be the folks in who run the 21st Century Community Learning Centers, which is a federal funding stream for after school. Um, and that's a formula grant that goes to the state. So there's state coordinators in every state. So we wanted to get a sense from many of them um, about what they thought were really appropriate and realistic outcomes for after school STEM. And the way we went about it was that we presented an initial framework of outcomes and indicators for them to react to. And we got a lot of responses, a lot. And any of you who've done qualitative um, data research knows how painstaking that can be. So we took all those comments and feedback and fed that back into the second round survey and sort of iterated on that a couple times until we reached consensus in the third round around what I will describe in a moment, but what we call sort of outcomes indicators and sub-indicators. And what you see in the report is also a a framework that we propose to sort of relate all of these together. So outcomes here describe the sort of major developmental impacts on young people. And what the study showed was that we got almost across the board consensus. It was about 97% consensus that, after, that the panel um, participating here believed that after school programs can do can achieve these kinds of impacts. And as you see, these are sort of big picture, big bin kinds of impacts. But they're important because what they really reflect are the kinds of things that we know are absolutely key and essential. So what they, so you know, if we were to describe these colloquially, what they would mean is, I like to do this, I can do this, and also equally importantly, I want to do this. And and we know from experience, as well as research increasingly telling us, that there has to be a feedback loop and a cycle between all three of these, because kids just liking to do it, but then not being able to do it or not having the capacities to do it doesn't really get you very far. Kids, being, kids coming to like to do something and being able to do something, but not caring enough about it or not thinking it's important to do, again, doesn't get you to the end goal. So you need all three of these to be working in tandem. And this is where we think that schools cannot do this by themselves. The entire onus is often placed on schools to deliver the end product that we want for STEM, which is a STEM literate workforce as well as a STEM literate citizenry. And we think that there's a huge role here for community groups, after school programs, science centers, museums, all these other areas where kids learn, because kids learn beyond the eight hours, six or eight hours that they might be in school. And so we think that there's a big role, and this study really is that effort to sort of define how these other groups can play. Now indicators, what we describe as indicators in the report, are sort of more concrete. We start to get a little bit more concrete about how young people can demonstrate progress towards these intended program outcomes. And what we asked them to do was essentially, these were, you know, after that process of iteration I described, we landed on these six indicators, and we asked the panel to basically rank them in order of what, how, of what they believed after school programs are best positioned to support. And so this is the ranking that we came up with. And then finally, we have sub-indicators, which are sort of 
the specific measurable dimensions of the indicator. So these are the kinds of things that you can actually go out and try and gather evidence. And, and you'll see in table three in the sort of study implementation section, we actually sort of suggest some examples of evidence because the kinds of evidence that programs can gather will, be, will vary from program to program. And that's the other thing that I want to say here is that you know, we did not intend for these goals to be a set of mandatory goals for all after-school programs because that's, it's a very diverse universe of after-school programs and what each program can do is entirely dependent on its circumstance. So the kinds of resources it has available to it, what kinds of partnerships we, it might be able to develop. But the hope is that by having these kinds of things spelled out, they can start to see how their work maps into larger STEM education goals and start to use some common language. So we, pr we presented a list of about 17 sub-indicators, which are these very concrete things that um, demonstrate impact. And we asked the panelists to rate their confidence in the field achieving these impacts and bin it as high, medium, and low. And so these ones that you see are the ones that they rated very highly. And you'll see here that this set really stresses the doing of science and the developing of skills to do science, including what are loosely termed these days as sort of 21st century skills. So sort of teamwork, problem solving. And the other thing you'll notice here too is that it's sort of the developing of views into future possible lives with sort of STEM, including career choices, relevance to everyday living, all those kinds of things which get at the, I care enough to actually want to do this. So the next set are the ones that people have been as having a medium level of confidence in. And, and this set is perhaps a little bit more specific in terms of links to um, STEM resources or expertise. It, it requires a demonstration of very specific types of knowledge and so the panel expressed a little bit less confidence in relationship to the other, but they didn't actually rate any of these as low. So they thought they were all doable. It's just, you know, they, they felt much more confident in that previous set that I described. So what does this really mean? You know, the ranking of these indicators, those six indicators I described at the beginning, shows that, as I said earlier, that there's most confidence in this panel um, about impacts that relate to the doing of science. And the rating of the sub-indicator shows sort of more confidence about supporting young people's interests and what we call the 21st century skills. And the thing that about those is that they're more immediate rather than longer term and they can be documented in the short term. So whether it's over the course of an afternoon or a week, and this is important to keep in mind when you think about the structure of after-school programs because a lot of kids drop in and drop out. They don't necessarily have to come all the time. And so what we're hearing here is that the field is saying the kinds of things that we can um, document are the things that you can see very quickly and immediately and they add up to something bigger, but here's what we can document quickly. And you'll see that they were a little bit less confident about the school-based outcomes, like enrolling in courses, improving academic performance in school, et cetera. And again, this is because this is something that's a little bit out of their control. You know, I mean, they're much, as, I mean, this is logical, right? I mean, we, people are confident about what they can directly impact. And, and I would suspect that's true for any group of people that you talk to. That's what they would express more confidence in. Um, we did see some differences in perspectives between the panelists. So these were the provider groups and the sort of supporter groups, um, which was one of the reasons that we actually didn't have a very homogenous group because as I said before, after school is very diverse, not just in the range of programming, but in the kinds of people who participate in it as stakeholders. And one of the key differences that, we, that was very striking to us was about assessment tools. Um, so while the, the study really focused on these sort of impacts that after-school programs could have, in the very last round, we did ask them to comment a little bit about the kinds of resources that they might need, which you see um, in Appendix 3 in the report. And the striking thing there is that they did not 
only point to money. They actually pointed to professional development needs, partnerships with STEM-rich organizations and STEM professionals as, as, as very key needs. And we also asked them about whether they believed there were assessment tools to document the kinds of impacts they were expressing confidence in being able to deliver. And what was striking is that the funder and policy group almost uniformly said yes, and the practitioner set group said no. So there's you know, many interpretations that, you know, we can only speculate because we didn't ask them to justify those choices, is that the funder group is overly optimistic. Mm -hmm or that the practitioner group doesn't know about all the available tools that are out there, or a more nuanced explanation might be that they are available of some of these tools, but don't think they really work when it comes right down to the realities of their programming. So clearly there's a need for a conversation here between the stakeholders to really talk through available tools and what kinds of new, new tools might be needed. And finally, the other thing is we noticed that there's a little bit of confusion in the field about sort of the semantics of describing these outcomes and indicators. Um, and we found that there were cases where they indicated where they might have rated something low, but then rate, uh, rated the associated sub indicators very high. And again, I think this is because the field hasn't um, yet necessarily on aggregate been thinking about how to map this all into a framework that relates to the larger STEM education goals of the nation. And so we hope that this study and the framework we propose here really helps to move the field forward in starting to use the kinds of language that the rest of the STEM education community might be using so that we can see the kinds of impacts that after school programs are having. And finally, um, we make a few recommendations for some of the key audiences we identified for this report, policymakers, the practitioners, and the evaluation and assessment experts. We think it's really important for folks who are setting education policy and funding STEM education initiatives to use a study like this to really think through what the appropriate niche for after school is in the larger ecosystem of STEM education where schools are one part of it, but there's a lot of other things that need to happen as well. And we hope, as I said, that practitioners will use the framework to start mapping out how the work contributes. And finally, evaluation and assessment experts um, really need to have a conversation with providers about the available tools. Um, and mapping it to the framework and using it to, um, to when they develop new tools and measures. And I'm going to stop here. I think I'm right on time, and that's my contact information. Thank you very much. Let me observe that there are seats up here. So those of you who are standing, please feel free to come on up and grab yourself a seat. And we'll turn it over to Ron. Great. Thanks, Linda. Thanks, Anita and Jody, uh, for having me uh, today. It's uh, a real pleasure and honor to be here with you and to be working uh, in this field. I also want to say thanks to some of the Noyce Foundation grantees uh, who are in the audience and maybe those who want to be a Noyce Foundation <laughs> grantee. Um, all of you are making invaluable contributions <coughs> uh, to the future of your communities. Uh, Linda, since, since this is a salon, I love that, uh, that name and that tradition, I hope to be a little provocative uh, in my comments um, as I talk about why uh, funders are interested in, in this area, what's already underway, and some of the scaling efforts of science and after school that are beginning to use these tools and measures. And I guess the first comment I would make is that I firmly believe, uh, if you look at my bio, I was on the San Diego City School Board uh, in San Diego, California uh, for 14 years. Um, I've been around public education and in philanthropy now for almost 30. Uh, and I believe that uh, the next generation science standards will fail uh, if science centers, after school organizations, and youth development organizations are not part of the rollout of the standards. and. Uh, and are not, and if the uh, the standards are narrowly defined as what as to what kids get in school, uh, I'd be willing to bet the funds in our portfolio um, that if we don't 
uh, focus on the kids who've been turned off the science, uh, and that's kids who aren't only young girls, who aren't only uh, low-income kids, but my kids and kids across the economic spectrum uh, who've been turned off to science, that we won't see any budge or change uh, in the percentage of kids uh, who are engaged with science going on to science and, and STEM uh, majors uh, and careers. Um, I think it's also true of uh, the general literacy and knowledge uh, about science uh, in, in the country. Um, some of you may have uh, uh, heard about a study by the public, uh, the public Agenda Organization, the Media uh, Survey Organization, did several years ago uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, and then replicated nationwide where they uh, surveyed and did focus groups on the attitudes of parents and kids about math and science education. And what was the conclusion? Yes, science is important, just not for my kid or for me. It's for those smart kids, for those kids, you know, who are the geeks. Um, and that's one of the reasons that the Noyce Foundation and others, uh, you know, who are now making a uh, coming together as a STEM funders network, the corporations involved and change the equation, uh, and others are focusing on this area of science and after school and out of school in addition uh, to what happens in school. Second, we're not starting from scratch, but the evidence that we have today, as Anita says, uh, is, is not enough. Uh, the Noyce Foundation had, has invested in developing a common instrument to measure interest and engagement in science and after school. Gil Nome at uh, Pear uh, Harvard McLean um, Hospital uh, is developing the instrument uh, along with a number of the youth development uh, and after school organizations um, in, in the country so that we can get a sense and looking across programs of what it takes. Uh, to increase the interest and engagement of kids and looking at what program features uh, might make a particular difference. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and for those of you who don't know, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore were the co-founders of Intel, so it's interesting that these two foundations are working on, on outcomes. Uh, but the Moore Foundation uh, has been investing uh, in what it takes uh, to um, help a uh, young science learner become activated, engaged in science, hopefully for their life. What, where is that aha moment where the light bulb goes on and a kid says, I understand why science is important, it's all around me, um, and why I need to pay attention to it. Uh, the National Science Foundation, who we all learn from and whose lead uh, we all follow, uh, is supporting a number of research and development efforts. And I wanted to mention two. Uh, one is they're validating uh, an observation instrument called Dimensions of Success uh, that will help after school and out of school time programs understand what quality implementation looks like. Uh, the second is a longer term effort. Uh, we need a longitudinal study and NSF and we and uh, SD Bechtel Jr. have uh, funded the front end of Robert Ty's work uh, to develop a longitudinal study that will tell us if a kid gets a, a particular uh, high dosage of uh, science and after school at middle school, what are the impacts of that over time? What courses, science courses, do they take in high school? Do they go into STEM majors? Do they select STEM careers? What's the long-term value of these investments uh, of science and after school? And we hope that these findings will be as, hopefully, as evocative um, as what we all learned from the Perry Preschool Longitudinal Study. That's the kind of study we need for this field. Um, Anita mentioned that there was a summit uh, in, recently, uh, last year, uh, on informal science outcomes uh, that the National Research Council and uh, Pear co-sponsored. And the reason for that is we need to know what that research and development agenda looks like, and we need more rapid prototyping based on that agenda to get from the 1.0 versions of these instruments we have today to the 2.0 versions uh, that will make an even greater difference as the next generation science, science standards roll out. And one of the purposes of this study uh, actually was to inform that research uh, agenda for the broader audience, that it, we felt it was important uh, that as 
uh, folks who've been working uh, in the NRC, uh, these um, academics uh, and, and practitioners, that they ought to have the voice uh, of what the after school and out of school time field believes they can achieve with outcomes in science education. And that leads to my final uh, note. Uh, when I was president of the San Diego, San Diego City School Board, I will never forget the teachers union president uh, about the uh, uh, second year I was uh, on the job, came to me and he said, because we were doing some major reform, he said, you know, we'll be here long after you're gone. <laughs> and he said, you know, the school reform stuff that you've begun, that'll pass too. It'll just be another, another passing fad. Uh, and so I think the challenge to all of us um, is, you know, what will be the commitment after uh, President Obama leaves office four years from now, and who knows who the next president will be, and will the science education efforts both in and out of school have gained enough traction uh, that it will survive no matter who uh, the president is of the country. Um, hopefully, it'll be someone who, who is still committed to science education. Um, but will change the equations, corporations, will the foundations that we're uh, involved with, will the government agencies uh, that are involved uh, with science education in and out of school, will the focus that we have today continue? Is this just a window of opportunity, or are we really creating something uh, for the long term. And we've got a lot in play now, uh, which we didn't uh, five or six years ago. Uh, the National 4-H Council, which is the largest youth development organization in the country, has a major science initiative. Anita mentioned the Girl Scouts, Girls Incorporated, the National Girls Collaborative Project, uh, U.S. First Robotics. Now the YMCA's have come to us, and they want to create a national effort uh, on science. Bud Rock is here, uh, you know, from Aztec. Over 300 science and children's centers are now engaging uh, with youth development organizations, libraries, um, with uh, park and recreation centers and schools uh, to get science programming uh, and disseminate it in the communities that we're working in. And perhaps the biggest play of all uh, is that we, uh, in the Noyce Foundation, have teamed up with the uh, Charles Stewart Mott Foundation to get science into uh, the 40 after-school networks uh, across the country, uh, starting with hopefully 20 um, over the next three years. And we've uh, followed the Wallace Foundation, who have developed uh, terrific after-school platforms in seven major cities in the country, and which will expand to 15, and we're getting science into those city-based uh, efforts. So that's why this study matters, because to grow this field, we need uh, to have outcomes that we all believe will help develop this field. So I hope you'll read the study. Um, I hope that you'll pass it on to those on your list um, who have influence. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. Thank you. Our Making the Future STEM Education initiative was launched about 16 months ago at the World Maker Fair at the New York Hall of Science. Making the Future seeks to inspire young learners in the STEM discipline by creating fun, hands-on learning opportunities. And there are a few key words here. First, we seek to inspire since we know that interest in STEM and not proficiency is a stronger predictor if students will pursue STEM careers. And we focus on fun, hands-on learning opportunities since these not only provide inspiration, but they develop essential 21st century learning skills like creativity, communication, and collaboration. Our program is themed after the growing maker movement. In, make, in the maker movement and at maker fairs popping up around the country, adults and, in, and children engage in do-it-yourself projects around electronics, robotics, 3D modeling, 3D printing, open source hardware and software, e-textiles, and many other fun, cool things. We feel that exposing kids to STEM, uh, to these kinds of fun, creative, hands-on projects will spark their interest in STEM. In addition to the advocacy work we do with organizations like Change the Equation, Making the Future has three components. First, we partner with like-minded education nonprofits, providing financial, in-kind, and volunteer support to organizations like the New York Hall of Science, Citizen Schools, and the Engineering as Elementary Curriculum from the Museum of Science Boston. And we also launched a new nonprofit this May called the Maker Education Initiative by partnering with Intel, Pixar, and the people at Maker Fair and Make Magazines. 
We also launched a, a U.S. college scholarship program last year, one of our scholarship winners right there. Uh, we give out $5,000 scholarships to 20 students pursuing the STEM uh, disciplines. Uh, 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 and they submit a three-minute video of something they've made, designed, built, and engineered, and that's the criteria for judging the scholarship. But finally, and most relevant to this morning's STEM salon, is we launched the Making the Future After School and Summer programs in 2012. In our pilot year, we funded 10 after school and summer programs, and we just wrapped up our 2013 grant cycle, uh, having received over 250 applications for the 20 grants that we have to offer this year. And I'm pleased to share today that we've selected 25 really outstanding programs to fund this year across 18 states. One of these programs will be just a few miles here at an elementary school in Washington, D.C. In our portfolio, grant recipients are children's and science museums, boys and girls clubs, 4-H, uh, schools, and other child-serving organizations. The program targets boys and girls from all backgrounds. Most programs tend to focus on children from 5 to 18 years old with a sweet spot around upper, middle, uh, upper elementary and middle school uh, ages we see as the sweet spot. And kids in these programs engage in maker-oriented, do-it-yourself activities, such as working with 2D and 3D design software, and sending their designs to digital fabrication tools like 3D printers and vinyl or laser cutters, working with circuits, electronics, low-cost open source microcontrollers such as the Arduino and Raspberry Pi platforms, and then programming those platforms using languages like processing and scratch. Our other projects include robotics, creating digital and mechanical musical instruments, hydroponics, agricultural and food related projects, and sewing and e-textiles. We're pretty flexible in how our partner organizations choose to implement the program and what activities they select. We strongly believe you cannot have a cookie cutter program that is operated in the same across the country, but instead must be designed to appeal to the demographics of the children in the program. For example, in urban areas, we find that programs like Build a Bike, Earn a Bike are really popular, where kids, if they can completely disassemble a bike and put it back together and it works, they're allowed to keep the bike, which can be very empowering to an urban youth. Other projects include um, uh, music projects are also uh, very popular, perhaps mixing hip hop music on a MIDI controller that you solder together yourself and playing it on a speaker that you built. And we find that certain types of projects appeal more to girls than to boys. Our program has five guiding principles. The program must be built around fun, engaging hands-on project-based activities. Children should make something versus just doing experiments or activities that don't have a final product. However, we still emphasize that the process and materials are more important than the end product, but the end product provides evidence of learning. Programs can follow a set, planned, a set of planned activities which will allow for individual creativity, deviation, experimentation, and trial and error. And children should be able to keep the projects they make so that they can share the pride and their accomplishments, retelling the making process and bring making out into their communities. Programs should be long enough in duration that children can really immerse themselves in a meaningful experience. This refers to both program duration, 20 to 40 hours total, and session duration, perhaps 90 minutes or more, maybe less for younger children. The primary intended outcome is to generate interest in the STEM fields, but more specifically want to get kids deeply engaged in fun activities that they, they may not necessarily think of as STEM, then in somewhat of a stealth fashion, allow them to come to the realization that these things they are enjoying are based in the STEM disciplines. It gives them a sense, uh, give them a safe place for trial and error, to experience failure as a natural part of the engineering design process, then overcome that failure at least some of the time. Give them a sense of confidence around STEM by saying, I made this, right? And they get a pr the pride in what they've done and what they've accomplished and can take that out into the community, share it with others, and retell the process they use to make that thing. Show the relevance of STEM in everyday life by showing how designing and making things that people use in everyday life requires STEM skills. Emphasize the creative and artistic as aspects of STEM as much as the purely scientific or engineering elements and this provides a pathway for more artistically inclined children to find their place in STEM and also draws out creativity and innovation in all children. And finally, uh, we emphasize uh, that learning by doing. We are more interested in what kids can do versus what they know. Maker-based maker programs allow doers to thrive, and we often find that children who tend not to excel in traditional schools will actually uh, thrive uh, in, in a, a maker program. And just uh, mapping this back to uh, the, uh, the study and the intended outcomes, um, first, if you, know, if you haven't opened your packet yet, 
my, my slides are following along the three uh, outcomes here, so if you want to uh, follow along. So in looking at our program, uh, first off, this is the first set of outcomes and the uh, indicators and sub-indicators. Uh, first, we clearly see that our, we, we see kids d developing interest and engaging in STEM activities. And uh, in particular, uh, if you notice the one thing there, uh, active information seeking about mechanical or natural phenomena or objects. That's really what making is all about, thinking about objects in life and what makes them happen and how they come together. So we see a strong mapping of what we're trying to achieve in our programs back to the study's uh, uh, first uh, outcome. Um, and then second, in terms of uh, being able to engage, develop the capacities to productively engage in STEM, if you walk into many of these maker programs, you just see kids totally and deeply engaged. It's amazing. Um, I teach uh, with citizen schools up in the Boston area. I teach at the Lily Pad Arduino e-textile program. One day I walked into the class and kids were, you know, as the, the prior session was wrapping, kids were misbehaving. There are bounding chairs on the floors. This is an urban, uh, urban sixth graders in Boston. We began our e-textiles activity. They're learning about circuits, sewing with conductive thread, programming their Arduinos. I, I never faced behavioral issues. The amount of engagement is just incredible when you get the right kinds of activities that are cool and engaging. So we think that's extremely important. And the other thing about this is that we also see that they can actually, uh, they can learn some life skills that uh, they might be able to use at some point later in their life. Anything from soldering to programming to working in teams. Uh, we tend not to focus so much on the knowledge uh, of STEM. We believe, let them go through the process, they'll pick up certain knowledge, but really we're trying to teach them how to engage so that they can hopefully go out later on and, you know, and, and find their own opportunities to engage further in, in the type of STEM activities that they enjoy. And finally, uh, we see that um, uh, maker-oriented programs allow uh, young people to see the value in STEM. They make things that have functional, whimsical, or aesthetic value, uh, subtly reinforcing the importance of STEM in everyday life. Additionally, some programs will engage children in projects that provide useful solutions to some of today's challenges. For example, in one program, uh, children used uh, Arduino-controlled hydroponic systems, and they realized that this could help potentially solve some of our urban uh, the challenges of urban deserts. Right? So they see meaning in some of the things they create. We find that particularly appeals to, to young girls, uh, sometimes more than young boys. They want to find purpose in what they're making, not just make you know, uh, crazy cars or things like that. So where do we go from here? First, our, our hope is that we can use this study to persuade uh, policymakers and funders of the importance of these types of out-of-school programs. These programs generate interest in ways that we don't see happening often enough in the typical stu school day, at least not right now. We also see different implications for underserved versus affluent communities. In underserved populations, we need more funding of these types of programs more spaces to conduct them, and more instructors or coaches to lead them. The demand is clearly there. In affluent communities, we find that time is the limiting factor, and I speak from experience with my own children. Uh, kids in affluent uh, communities tend to be so heavily scheduled, we need to free up time from some of the other activities and children schedules who may be doing four seasons of soccer lacrosse, taking ballet and music lessons. This is the challenge I face with my own daughter in running a makeup program in my town scheduling was the biggest obstacle to agree with all the parents about the one day a week that kids could break out of their activities to come and do this kind of activity. And we need to you know, emphasize that this is another important kind of extracurricular activity. Uh, second, at Cognizant, we plan to use this framework to do a more detailed mapping of the expected outcomes of our program to help convince others of the value. But to be honest, demand for the program is not a problem. We could easily be running 100 of these across the country right now if we had more funding sources. But we'd like to be able to persuade more corporations and foundations to join us, and, and, and they will want evidence. But for us, we clearly see the value. And to quote Bob Dylan, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. <laughs> and finally, we see that we could use this framework, and particularly the examples of evidence provided in each sub-indicator that Anita talked about, as a, to develop an evaluation tool that will help our partners know if they are achieving their expected outcomes. We might tweak or expand some of the indicators due to the uniqueness of maker-based programs. But overall, the framework matches pretty well to expected outcomes. And, and uh, we really appreciate the Noyce Foundation and the Bechtel Foundation uh, for joining forces with the After School Alliance. And we greatly appreciate Change the Equation for providing this forum. Thank you. Well, this is the part where we turn to your questions. Let me just uh, 
pause for one moment because I'm seeing lots of unfamiliar faces and say Change the Equation hosts these salons approximately once a month, not on a set day, not on a set oh, day of the week because it depends on the availability of our speakers. And we are very grateful uh, for both our regular attendees and our sporadic attendees and our new attendees because we really are trying to be um, thoughtful and deliberate about having real conversations about how we're going to move the enterprise forward. There are some folks, myself included, I can look at a few other faces in the room, who've been doing this for quite some time. And we want to make, uh, see, I knew I'd get a smile from you, buddy. <laughs> um, we, we want to make sure that this time we succeed, because we've, we've been on this precipice before. And one of the interesting things I see at Change the Equation, so we're 100 companies strong, is their deep and abiding passion to get more kids reach what they call STEM literacy, not just tomorrow's engineers or physicists, but really literacy. There is often the phrase, particularly students of color and girls. Uh, but in fact, that's not enough of a focus. It's really all students and how are we going to have that impact. Our member companies together invest nearly two-thirds of a billion dollars a year in their philanthropy in the K-12 space. That is a lot of money. But what we also hear, and part of the reason many of them join Change the Equation, is a concern that they are not getting the return on their investment. If we're putting this money in, are we really seeing the kind of progress? And that's part of why I drove Anita a little nuts about the need for a study like this. And I've been driving Ron a little nuts as well, uh, not because I don't understand the challenges and the hurdles that are involved, but rather because we really have to know in this incredible proliferation that we have of STEM programs, which ones are really going to make a difference, because they don't all uh, have the same impact. So with that, let me turn it over to you. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We ask that you identify yourself and your organization and make sure that it's a question. <laughs> right here, please. Oh. I'm a, ooh, oh, this is, I don't need a mic. Uh, I'm a teacher. Uh, uh, my name is Paulo Omic. I'm, I'm an Einstein fellow. I'm working at NASA, the Office of Education. And my question is for Ron. You made a very provocative, and I thank you very much for your candor uh, statement at the beginning of your talk about how the NGSS are, will, are destined for failure if the after school programs don't follow suit and all these things. And I would like you, if you could elaborate on that. And also, you make another many good points that was good that she saw in that, uh, about that survey about parents saying that, no, that's not for my kid, it's for the privileged kids. And as a teacher, I experienced that in after school programs that I led, that usually you end up with those kids that the parents already have the college degree, they have the, the, the income and all that. And I had to, actively pursue those kids, uh, talking to parents in Spanish, and those that they really need that after school program. So if you could elaborate on that first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Um, oh, when you interview kids, most kids will tell you science in school is boring. Uh, I mean, that is the prevailing attitude of, of kids when you talk to them about science education. There are very few examples, but mostly in STEM-oriented schools, you know, where you get rich, hands-on, inquiry-based uh, science in school. Um, so I think the feeling is that, you know, with the new standards, which lend themselves more to the to what's been going on in informal science and science centers and in, in after school spaces to really push kids you know, on projects, uh, to really you know, learn the inquiry uh, you know, process and so forth, that you've got a chance to, to get the best of both worlds, turning kids on, helping them experience uh, science in, in the spaces uh, that Mark and, and others are involved in 
at the same time is then the, the content knowledge, you know, that kids gain in school. Um, so I think both, without both, I don't think we'll see the gains uh, that we all uh, are hoping for. Yeah, please use the mic because it's being. <coughs> Hi. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're right, Paula. This is crazy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kamsi McAdams, and I'm the senior policy advisor on STEM at the U.S. Department of Education. So I definitely want to talk a little bit more um, to everyone after this. And I really appreciate the range of um, of presentations. And I'm I, I put it on Twitter. I really appreciate the breadth of the commitment on Cognizant's part that there's things that are promoting after school and in school. But the one thing I didn't hear anybody talk about was who's doing this after school work? Who are these pr practitioners? Because if science during the school day is boring and many schools rely on teachers to run after school problem programs, except for with the exception, I think you spoke about citizen schools and your relationship with them. But if the teachers are left to run the after school programs and they are already scared of science, or making science boring, then how can we make these um, programs be very robust? And you know, having been in a district, I know that that's who we would turn to. We would get these great programs in that were provided by community-based organizations, but the teachers ultimately were leading them. So I don't know if you could speak a little bit to, about who is actually doing the the, pre the providing of these services. Sure, um, I mentioned uh, a few of them. Four um, H is the biggest. Um, and they're not only, um, you know, in clubs, but also uh, after school. Um, uh, Girl Scouts through TechBridge, um, which is an after school science and engineering program, middle based focus on middle school girls out of Oakland is now scaling within uh, the Girl Scouts um, network. Uh, same with Girls Incorporated and uh, Build IT, which is an IT program focused and geared to to middle school girls. Uh, the YMCAs, um, which probably reached the audience that we all uh, hope to reach um, uh, more than most, um, uh, is talking to us and to 4-H uh, about a national uh, effort um, to get involved in science. And then, um, as I mentioned, the Mott After School Networks uh, are in 40 states. Um, 20 of those states uh, are launching uh, into science. California is probably the largest because we have a dedicated after school funding source in California. Uh, and so now the question is how do we get the science centers and 4-H and the other providers of science uh, to reach out and train um, the, the traditional after school providers. <laughs> we, don't have to, we don't have to answer that, but I just think you could all speak yes. that, 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 that blend of services and the stuff that's happening in the after school. You could just know you're not doing after school. You could just be I think, I think Mark would speak to that. Well, I'll, I'll try to address that. I just want to let me first add on a little bit. So, of the we we posted our grant application on one website. We got 250 grant requests, and we sort of we broke down the demographics. We saw a lot from the science and children's museums. Um, a lot of libraries across the U.S. are wanting to you know re to transform themselves. Uh, 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 we got 22 grant requests from Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, half a dozen from 4-H, and we're funding several 4-H programs. Um, schools and uh, then maker spaces and other informal groups, collaborations. In Newport, Rhode Island, we had a collaboration come together of a community organizer, someone at Solvay Regina University in their hydroponics lab with a local business um, and a parent just came together. And so we see a lot of different collaborations. And that's who's running them. The other question is who's instructing them. So the, the science museums often will have people capable of that. Um, but we're trying to build, really, for our types of program through the Maker Education Initiative, trying to build a nationwide network of instructors. But we often, the types of, uh, we see engi you know, engineers and computer scientists who are professionals teaching. We see uh, grad students from, you know, we have uh, an MIT grad student teaching one of our programs in Boston. We have entrepreneurs who, uh, particularly uh, several uh, African-American entrepreneurs who are saying, I need to give back and do this. And then you see organizations like DIY Girls, um, Black Girls Code, you see all these different organizations creeping up who are really trying to uh, run the programs and build their own uh, network of instructors. 
And in some cases, we are seeing really interesting collaborations between schools and these local organizations. Matter of fact, you know, our DC program is at the Mari Elementary School, and that's a collaboration with a, you know, a nonprofit and a school, um, and you know, finding instructors. And, and if I may, I want to add on to that to say, Kamsi, that about a third of the instructors in after school programs are actually school day teachers who are certified. And what we hear from them is that after school gives them an opportunity to teach the way they wish they could during the school day. And that's a very sad statement for us to hear, but that's what they say, that, you know, that it provides the kinds of flexibility that they don't often have during the school day. And we just actually did a survey with NSTA to query science teachers across the country about what they thought of the utility and potential of after-school STEM programs. And they were overwhelmingly positive and viewed them as partners. Many of them are participating and leading these after-school programs, whether as primary leads or as sort of co-leads. And the other thing, when I said the thing about professional development needs for after-school providers, so, you know, the, all the kinds of organizations uh, that Ron and Mark mentioned, many of them have experts who understand the content and can do this, but many of them are also run by youth development experts who really know how to work with kids. And because, as I said at the beginning, this is more than about just academic proficiency. It's about meeting a lot of needs of kids so that we're setting them up to be successful adults. And so it's, it's the youth development experts who are wanting professional development. And what we're finding is that when they get quality professional development, <laughs> they can facilitate excellent STEM after school programs because this is about a process of inquiry together. It's not about the sage on the stage who knows all the answers and can tell the kids this is the answer and this is how we're going to go towards it, but saying, but sometimes it's very powerful to have an adult standing at the front of the room saying, this is what science is like. You start off not knowing the answer and let's figure this out together. So there's actually a very important role for these folks who know how to work with kids but may not be STEM experts to, to have a role in, in leading these programs. And so we shouldn't sort of limit the kinds of after-school programs where only experts are leading this because there's a huge role for all kinds of people to be leading this and it's important for kids to see that. Good morning, I'm Elizabeth Partoyan. I'm Vice President with Collaborative Communications Group. Thank you all for uh, what you shared, each of you. Uh, the question that I have, I think, is really mostly a policy question, sort of at the, at the far end of where, you're, where you've been sharing. I'm thinking about, I'm cognizant of <laughs> um, <laughs> our conversation about what makes good programs, what the good inputs are, how we know we're doing well, but the reality that through both um, eventually if, if things move in the direction we anticipate the next generation science standards, but certainly the existing common core in math, um, the, the need for what I'll call the credentialing of knowledge at the system level about students' mastery of this learning. So we have standards, we have expectations, we want young people to move to demonstration of mastery, but how do we as adults in the system make sure that young people know you know, how do we know that they know? Um, it can't just be what they learn from their course curriculum during the school day. We know that they're learning during the non-school hours. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about how we in a system, it's the school system that's formally responsible for accountability on whether young people learn these things, regardless where they are learning them. And so I'm thinking about competency-based learning and, and progressions toward that. How do we know? How do we do that? And how do we push what we do know to get people there? So I can start off, and um, Mark and Ron can jump in. Um, you know, this is definitely an issue that's gaining momentum um, as we are sort of seeing more and more partners in spaces where STEM learning is happening. And so this whole notion of the digital badges that the MacArthur Foundation has been talking about is definitely an idea that's gaining a lot of interest. We're still at the very beginning stages of that, but that's the sort of, you know, that's the trend for how do we capture competencies beyond grades? 
how to, you know, it's basically like certificates, right? I mean, people do certificate courses, somebody actually credentials them. And there's also some very interesting models out there when school districts and after school providers partner together. So in, I think it's New Hampshire, and Jody will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's in New Hampshire where we see these very interesting collaborations between the school district and the after school programs where if a student wants to learn something that perhaps is not offered during the school day. So one example I have of, is of a child who is of this girl who wanted to learn Chinese and there was no Chinese courses that were offered at the school. And so they did this combination of um, online, some online material that she could, they found a local tailor in the community who was a native Chinese speaker. And so it was this, and she was able to practice her spoken Chinese and written Chinese with this gentleman. And so between that collaboration of the school, the after school provider and a community based, uh, and someone in the community, they were able to come together and really certify her proficiency. So I think there's a lot of models for innovation out there um, but we do need to think out, outside the box if we want to do that. And so, you know, I think. <clears throat> yeah, I think one of the things that, and I'm just disqualifier, disqualification here. I've kind of had 26 years in IT and I'm two years in education, so I'm not an educational mm -hmm. expert and I don't claim to be. But what we're seeing a lot is, you know, really evidence of learning through things like digital portfolios. So, you know, if, uh, you know, we, we, and we've talked to some college, you know, engineering placement officers about this. If they saw a three-minute or five-minute video of something so, a, a, a young, you know, high school senior designed, built, and engineer could describe the process, they would feel much, you know, in some cases, they would feel more confident admitting that person to their program than the person who just, you know, has a, a 4.0 from some high school somewhere. So we like to think about show us what you can do, um, you know, as evidence of learning. Now, that's hard to implement at scale, but that's, you know, I think digital portfolios are an interesting idea that could be an answer to that. Gentlemen. Good morning. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Carlos Manjarres. I'm from the Institute of Museums and Library Services. We've talked a bit about um, the organizations involved the instructors. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the composition of the students or the makers. Um, one big concern um, that that I have is that there's selection bias in the in the young people who are getting engaged. Um, the people who are getting engaged are those who are more likely to uh, be involved in school, are more likely to be joiners in other in other aspects of their lives. And so the question is, how do we assure that this very important activity is actually reaching a broad cross-section of students um, and is not essentially creaming, um, as is a concern for a lot of after-school programs? That's why uh, we feel um, the effort with traditional after-school programs that are primarily on school campuses uh, is so important and particularly focusing on the 21st Century Learning Center uh, programs who, you know, have a mandate to focus on low-income uh, students um, is so critical. Uh, and 21st Century is now launching its own uh, effort, uh, technical assistance effort, uh, to help uh, organizations launch um, into the science programming. So your point is very well taken. Uh, it's very easy. Uh, for all of us, uh, you know, to only focus on the kids who, who've traditionally been served. But for the Noyce Foundation and for most of the, of the uh, philanthropic uh, foundations, and I would say also for corporations involved in this, the idea is to go beyond the kids um, uh, who are already turned on to science and to really focus on probably the 60 percent or more of the kids, you know, who have been turned off to science. Um, so. You know, that's something we all need to pay more attention to. Partnerships uh, is so critical. Getting to the Boys and Girls Clubs, to the YMCAs and others uh, is so important. Um, and it's a big challenge, I think, for the Maker Fair folks because it's generally parents, you know, who bring their kids to Maker's Fair. So we've got to find different ways, uh, you know, to get kids from all backgrounds. And that's happening. Um, Go to Detroit, for instance. <laughs> yeah, so a couple examples. Like, we're running a program at Dream Yard Academy in the Bronx in Warsania. I think it's one of the lowest income di districts in the U.S. And so that after-school arts academy has been that community, and they know the kids. 
they're, they have trust with those children in that community and they can pull them in and they actually go out and do a lot of active recruiting and knocking on doors and, and incentives for kids to come. Uh, so that's you know, an example. We tend to say, you know, focus on the organization that have the relationships with the kids and then enable to run these programs versus coming in with some, you know, something new where places don't have. Uh, you know, another, another example is Mal and Elliott Makerspace. It's in the basement of a church in a very, uh, you know, in, in downtown Detroit. And again, they have trust. They're not only teaching the kids, they're also teaching the parents around these digital uh, technologies. So I think to some degree the portfolio has to include a mix of organizations that are already embedded and have relationships with some of the kids who are not, would not think of themselves as scientists by any stretch. And sometimes art can be that bridge because they may be interested in art or mixing music and that can be the gateway, sort of the gateway drug to get them into to STEM or sport. And definitely, you know, that's a huge um, emphasis for, I think, a lot of after school programs is to really try and figure out how we broaden participation. And so we, at the Alliance, we work a lot with the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program, which is the federal funding stream that goes primarily to Title I schools across the country. And so as I flashed up at the very beginning, we do think of ourselves as systems builders. And so that's a huge area of focus for us to really figure out how do we get more innovative, interesting programming into these kinds of schools. Because so often what we find is the lowest income schools end up with you know remedial work and after school or other things like that that are not really engaging for the kids and not the kinds of things we need them to be doing and of course funding always plays a huge role you know i mean the demand for after school far outstrips the available public funding streams that are out there and that's why it's great to see these kinds of private um, corporations and philanthropic organizations getting so engaged in this space and investing in it and I think Jody might have something to add to that. Jody Grant is the executive director. I'll just jump in. Since I've commented, well, Jody, Jody, one second. Um, um, it's it's both a comment and a question, which is that um, we keep hearing. I think one of the success stories is the real value of partnerships, rich partnerships, where we have the private sector, the public sector, community-based organizations, schools coming together, and that's one of the trademarks of a high-quality program. But what I'm curious about is these partnerships, which are so important, um, 21st Century Community Learning Centers, a federal funding stream for after school, the average applicant has six partners. So it's a funding stream that gives priority to organizations, entities that apply with partnerships. Um, I want to ask Anita, are there other federal funding streams where we can, where these partnerships are encouraged? Are there other avenues that we can be looking to? And also, what can we be doing about 21st century? Because I know it, it is in danger. Um, so definitely, yeah. I mean, there are actually more than 120 public funding streams that we track. I mean, not all of them are very big. Many of them are very small. Definitely the Department of Education's 21st Century Community Learning Centers program is the biggest funding stream that's out there. Um, the Department of Justice has programs. Um, NASA has, a, has funding streams through its Summer of Innovation, which requires partnerships. The National Science Foundation and, you know, has always been investing, one of the pioneers of investing in informal science education. and. Um, they, many of the National Science Foundation programs that get funded are often partnerships with higher education institutions. So it's often universities that are partnering with youth organizations and other resources in the community. So there's definitely, I think partnerships are um, a hallmark of these kinds of programming because what you find is that after school providers just wanna get this done. You know, they, they're not, um, they're not fighting turf issues. They want to sort of provide these kinds of exposures and experiences for the kids. So they are very willing and open to any partnerships and any partners that step up and say, we want to work with you. So I think all these public funding streams, I don't know that they explicitly demand partnerships, but that is often the way it all works out. And I'm wondering, with a little time left, if we could just hear the questions. We may not be able to answer them all, but it looks like there are about eight or ten people. I'm wondering if we could at least know what's, what's on people's minds. Sure. I want to pose one question first, take okay. the uh, host's prerogative, uh, and then we, we can at least do a quick poll of them. People tend to stay and yeah, I'm just curious. hang on you, but sure, we can hear those questions. And let me see if I can put it very, very succinctly. Um, speaking on behalf of 
change the equation members, they're eager to fund programs, but not in perpetuity. They want to have a change. Okay, Mark, you're an exception. Mm -hmm. um, Megan, you're probably an exception. <laughs> but, but beyond that, they, they want to invest it, and they want to know that that program is going to be able to sustain itself after X years. That's one important issue. The other is that the Delphi study showed more uh, confidence in the ability to show short-term gains than long-term gains. And in some ways, that's a little bit of a problem to funders like corporate America. And I'm wondering how we can address that sustainability issue and the long-term impact. Well, real quickly on the second question, that's why I think we've got to fund some longitudinal studies. Um, we've got to know what the effects are over time. And, I, and so funders are going to come together, I, hopefully, to, to fund at least one study that will do that. Uh, sustainability, I think, gets back to partnerships, which Jody just uh, mentioned, and, and to know what quality is. And we've got to be hard-nosed about what, what is quality and what's worth doing and what's not really quality and that shouldn't be supported. Um, and, you know, the, some of the battles that unfortunately we have to take on, um, we do, such as, you know, the, the attempt, um, uh, you know, to take all the 21st century learning center money and, and push it all into the school day and expand the school day. And, and those of us who've been involved in this are worried that partnerships won't be part of the answer, that it'll just be more of the same. I was on the school board and we instituted, which was a huge failure, a triple block <laughs> uh, of math um, for kids who were not succeeding uh, in high school. It was an utter failure because they just did the same thing. We can't just, as Anita said early on, you know, rely on on uh, schools alone, you know, to to be the answer. And I don't think they want to either. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, again, taking that second issue first about short-term versus long-term, I think in addition to what Ron said about longitudinal studies, the other thing that I think we need some investment in the research and evaluation community is to see how this interplay between school and out-of-school outcomes play together because they feed on each other and, it, and we're very much in the mode of viewing each of them in very siloed ways of this is the impact of out-of-school programs and this is the impact of in school and we need to stop thinking like that because it's just not the way it works and so definitely I hope that there's some investment in that so that we can see how the short-term gains that can be demonstrated and it's not that it's only short-term gains that are made in the after-school program but it might be what's actually able to be documented in the after-school program mm -hmm. how that feeds into the longer-term gains that happen in school and then how that feeds back into what's happening in after school and in terms of sustainability, absolutely. I mean, it's partnerships, it's diversifying funding streams, it's preserving, protecting, growing public funding streams because um, corporations, you know, I mean, f the focus of an organization might change five or 10 years from their initial investment. And it's great for getting something started, but longer term, public funding streams are often the way these programs survive or they get so embedded in a community that the community finds ways to fund it because they see the value in local businesses, philanthropies, and corporations make a very long-term commitment to doing that. So let me close it here. I apologize for anyone who's really hoping to put one more question on the table. Maybe you can come up at the end. And just with two reminders, our next STEM Salon is February 27th. And it will be focused on the issue of where's the E in STEM when we think about schools and we think uh, particularly about in-school learning. So what are we doing about engineering education, particularly in light of the next generation science standards? The other thing I would just point out is that Change the Equation hopes that you can take back to your own partners and community our free online game uh, based learning environment called Ion Future. You have a magnet stick on your refrigerator or wherever might be uh, fitting. And it is particularly targeting middle school and early high school kids and giving them the sans 
chance to explore the fact that STEM is everywhere and STEM leads to a variety of careers. And uh, it's important to study hard and learn that STEM to keep all of those careers open. We are very pleased that so far, 57% uh, of those creating profiles are females. So we are rocking it with girls who are planning ahead. Thank you so much for coming today.